Matthew chapter 10. We have made it into the double digits in Matthew, but it's still going to be a long time. But Matthew 10, this is an answer, an answer to the prayer that Jesus tells his disciples to pray at the end of chapter 9. Uh, and just to pick up there at verse 37 of chapter 9, Jesus said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the labors are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out labors into his harvest. And wouldn't you know, the very next line is what? And he called to him his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and every affliction. So this is an answer to the prayer that Jesus has just told them to pray. So when we pray, don't be too shocked if God doesn't move you to be the one who he is in fact calling. So he calls his 12. He says the names of the 12 apostles are these. First, Simon who is called Peter, and Andrew his brother, James the son of Zebedee, and John his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew the tax collector, James the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon the zealot, and Judas Iscariot who betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent out, instructing them, Go nowhere among the Gentiles, and enter no town of the Samaritans, but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And proclaim as you go, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse lepers, cast out demons. You receive without pain, give without pay. Acquire no gold or silver or copper for your belts, no bag for your journey, or two tunics or sandals or a staff, for the laborer deserves his food. And whatever town or village you enter, find out who is worthy in it and stay there until you depart. As you enter the house, greet it. And if the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. And if anyone will not receive you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet when you leave that house or town. Truly I say to you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah than for that town. So the disciples are going to be sent out. They are the ones who need to go into the harvest. Jesus has commissioned them. We're going to talk about what that entails in a minute. But over the next few weeks, minus next week, we're going to be walking through chapter 10. And the first part of chapter 10, these first 15 verses, we are going to see the, the task of the missionary. And we are all missionaries. This is not just written for those uh, professional, if you would, ones who we do send into foreign lands so often. But it is for every one of us. If you are a Christ follower, then you and I are called to be missionaries in the context of where you live, you work, you play. All of those environments are, 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 are there because God has placed you in them. None of this is by chance. So we're going to look at this today, and then starting in two weeks, we're going to look at the reaction of those that are sent out, uh, what they will face. They are going to face opposition. It's, it's not just going to be, hey, every door is going to be open to you. No different today. We can go out and we can share the gospel, but not everyone is going to be receptive. As a matter of fact, the truth of the matter is probably the majority of people will not be receptive, uh, at least not initially. So we need to be persistent. Uh, we need to continually be in prayer for the lost, but we also need to take the gospel to the lost. And then the last part of chapter 10, we'll see the cost of one who is sent that there is a cost to following Christ. Uh, it's not that you get all of these uh, you know, free Groupons if you follow Christ. It's, 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 it's hard. You may even find that you will uh, lose a few friends and maybe even family along the way if you truly commit. They may start to distance themselves from you, uh, say that you're one of those Jesus freaks or something, which is a compliment uh, if you have that call. So we're going to look at that over these next few weeks. So if you would, you bow your head with me. Father, we thank you for this word this morning. We pray that our eyes will be open and our ears will, will hear the word this morning clearly, that you will remove the distractions to so many things that we just allow to kind of bog us down. And Father, that, that at this moment we just uh, seek to hear you speak to our hearts, that Father, you would draw us near to you and that we, as these uh, 12 men, 
as Christ followers, will understand what it is to be called, to be commissioned, to be sent out uh, into uh, the uh, communities and the areas that, God, you have placed us in to be light and salt to a lost world. And we love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. So the first thing we see is that these 12 men are called, or they are commissioned. Uh, Jesus is not giving them an option, by the way. Uh, this isn't, he has gone around the room and said, hey, who's open for a cool trip, right? Who's ready to go to dot, dot, dot? No, they are being told. They are literally being commanded. Uh, if you go down to verse 5, you will see that these 12 Jesus sent out. Um, he commissioned them. But they weren't just to, um, you know, think about it or, or go get their affairs in order or, or make sure that uh, their family was going to be okay. No, they were commissioned to go. They were called to leave all that they had and to obey Christ. Now, this is a, a short-term mission trip. Some of you have been on short-term mission trips. Uh, others may be longer. But they are being sent out. We know from other gospel accounts, they are sent out two by two. They're not sent out individually, but two uh, by two they will go throughout the area. Now, C.T. Studd, who was um, probably the most established uh, cricketer, which I'm not sure is a word, but I'm going to use it until I get corrected on it. Uh, but he was basically the most renowned cricket player in the world in his day. He was an incredibly gifted athlete. Uh, he was everything you could imagine. Uh, he was, you know, he was the varsity captain. He came from a very affluent family. Uh, if you would, the, the world was his oyster. He could do whatever he desired. But God got hold of his heart. And when God got hold of his heart, he changed him so radically that I want you to read a couple of quotes that C.T. Studd had. He says, Some wish to live within the sound of church and chapel bell. I want to run a rescue shop within a yard of hell. Not many have said that, but it'd be, that would be, that would be a, you know, a, a good line. Good word there. And then he has this, which many of you have probably heard over the years, but he says, Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. That's all that matters. And that we, as these 12, we have been commissioned. We have been called to go. It literally says, go out into the areas that Christ has sent them to. Notice in 2 Corinthians, Paul, and this is uh, uh, where we ourselves are ministers of the new covenant says, are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Or do we need, as some do, letters of recommendation to you or from you? You yourselves are our letter of recommendation written on our hearts to be known and read by all. And you show that you are a letter from Christ delivered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Such is the confidence that we have through Christ toward God. Not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything as coming from us, but our sufficiency is from God, who has made us sufficient to be ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. We know that Christ ushered in the, the new covenant that last night he spent with the disciples. And we are today under this new covenant. The word covenant is the same that we have for testament. We are under the new covenant, the gospel of grace, the doctrines of grace, and that we are all called to take this good news. This uh, command here is the same as a superior would give to an inferior. It is a command that would have been issued to soldiers. It is a military command that does not come with the ability to opt out. This command is only to be responded by, yes, sir. If you've been in the military, you know that when you are commanded by your superior office, officer to do something, how do you respond? Yes, sir. You don't have to agree with your superior officer. You don't have to like the assignment. But you do have to respond because he has authority over you. And from what I understand from Trent, he can really make your life miserable. No, I'm just kidding. Trent is probably complying all the time. Let's be honest. But no, it is 
a reality that we need to respond. We do not get a opt out of this. John MacArthur says that the preacher is not a chef, he's a waiter. God doesn't want you to make the meal, he just wants you to deliver it to the table without getting it messed up. And that's what each of us are called to do, is to deliver this message of the gospel. So when you go to lunch after church today, and your waiter or waitress brings you the wrong food, or it's not right, you should say, can I help you? And go back in the kitchen and help fix it the right way. Amen? <laughs> Wouldn't that be an active service, though? Right? Help out. We are delivering. We should understand that this is, this is uh, you know, a work that we have been called to do. So the effective missionary, the effective disciple, um, is under divine order. It doesn't come with options. We are committed to be obedient. That's why the Word of God tells us that, that God does not require sacrifice. He requires obedience. That's why we see in Matthew 28, as we know of the Great Commission, which is not a suggestion. It is, in fact, a empirical command. It says, Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things. Some of you may have obey in your copy of God's words, teaching them to obey or to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. And I think obey is, 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 is a better word there. Uh, we're not just observing from a distance. We are to actually do what it says. Uh, the Word of God is not a book of uh, suggestions. It is God's Word. It is God's truth for all people in all times, in all places. It does not change. It is not affected by any uh, dictator, by any world event. It is the truth that we simply need to obey. It doesn't matter what culture, what culture tells us. It doesn't matter what our own government decides is a definition for something. It is what does God's word say. God and God alone is he who we will one day stand and account for. So he calls forth these 12 men, and it says he gave them authority over unclean spirits. And then he will list, Matthew is going to give us the list of the 12 disciples. You will notice the first one mentioned is Simon. In all the gospel accounts, Simon or Peter is always listed first. So we kind of, you know, uh, uh, surmise from that. I mean, Peter was, relatively speaking, the kind of the leader of the Twelve. He was the spokesman. We know quite often he would kind of step out in front of the group. Uh, he was the one who stood up at Pentecost and delivered uh, just, an, just an incredible sermon that the very Spirit of God had instructed him to do so. So he is listed first. Then we see others, and in the same, uh, also in the other Gospel accounts, we always see Judas Iscariot listed last. Uh, the ones between there sometimes vary in the order, and even in this case it says Philip and Bartholomew. Uh, in the other gospel accounts, he will be known as Nathaniel, which is, is the same uh, disciple. So they're all listed here, and it's very important to know that each of these 12 men uh, were committed to Christ. Obviously, Judas uh, had a little different agenda in that. And that 10 of these men... Ten of these twelve, minus Judas, who would take his own life, and John, who historically we uh, believe died at a relatively old age, these other ten men would die a martyr's death. They would literally take the gospel, for some of them, to the ends of the earth. The gospel from this uh, ragtag group of men would go as far as India and Ethiopia and other parts of Africa and to the majority of the known world. They fully committed. Now in this passage here, as he sends them out, notice he instructs them that they are to go nowhere among the Gentiles, that they are not to enter any of the towns, uh, any, no town of the Samaritans, but they are to go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Why does Jesus give them this specific command? I'm glad you asked. Well, we see in Romans that Paul addresses this partially when he says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. The Jewish people were God's chosen people. God called Abram, who he would change his name to Abraham, and from Abraham he called a family. And remember, Father Abraham, 
Remember that song? So he would call a family, and from this family, he would call a people. And we know these as the, the children of Israel. And from this people, he would ultimately call a nation. You see, Israel and the Jewish people were to be a witness. They were to be salt and light. They were the means in which God was going to evangelize the known world. They were to be his children and they were to be witnesses to all that Christ had done. Unfortunately, they uh, and many did not recognize Jesus as the Messiah. But we see here that Jesus sends them out with a particular purpose. They are to go to the Jewish people because that is simply God's order. Now, we know that God ultimately will raise up the Apostle Paul. And the Apostle Paul, of all people, as, as Jewish as you can be, born of the tribe of Benjamin, an Israelite of Israelites, zealous for the law, trained under Gamaliel, a true Jew in every way, but yet it is Paul who will carry the gospel to the Gentiles. He will be the missionary to all those who are non-Jewish. But yet when Paul would enter every town and every village, where did Paul first go? To the synagogue, right? He would go to the synagogue because there were in most all of these towns at least a, a, a remnant of God-fearing Jews. But even today, if you go to Israel, you will not find uh, an overabundance of even God-fearing Jews. Israel has become uh, an apostate state. It is not, uh, by and large, does not recognize God. It does not recognize Jesus as the Messiah. There are less than 20,000 Messianic Jews in all of Israel. That is an incredibly small number when you consider uh, the land and over 2 million people that uh, surround this area. But they were to be the witnesses. And he sends them directly there because it is God's order. Secondly, he sends them because they were Jewish. The disciples were Jewish. They, they understood at least contextually where they were going. They understood uh, the Jewish law. Uh, they would have understood the customs and all that would have occurred. So they at least would have some basic knowledge. Um, to parachute in is difficult. Even in our own world, in, in, in our Southern Baptist world, we have a, a missionary learning center just 20 miles uh, out to our west in Rockville. And one of the things that every missionary that goes through the learning center has to do is understand the culture and the context in which they are going. Uh, if they just drop in with no knowledge, they can do little things or say things. Or, you know, there's different things. Hand gestures mean different things in different cultures. You know, you have to understand that, that, that you shake with certain hands because other hands are used for sanitary purposes. So if you go in with the wrong hand, you can be insulting that person. So you have to understand this. So, so we make sure that they are as trained as possible to, to understand where they're going. They obviously are still going to have to learn a lot, and they're going to have to learn language skills and all of this. But, but here are the disciples. They just culturally knew the Jewish people, at least as well as they could. And it was just the starting point. This was the starting point, not the finishing point. And now there are cases today where, where God may raise up someone um, that has a heart for a particular people group and that people group may be where they go but the gospel is for all people it is for those of all uh, nationalities we know in revelation that god's word says there will be a people from every tongue every tribe and every nation gathered around the throne of god here's the news flash for you okay this is not meant to be offensive okay white americans are going to be the vast minority in heaven not complicated to figure that out, right? We good? Everybody good? Okay? We ain't going to be the only ones standing around Jesus. Matter of fact, if we were probably honest, about half the church in America probably won't make it because they've not been generally born again. But this is how God's order is. Jesus himself said, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. So he sends them out. To go and he gives them this authority. John Stott says that we must be global Christians with a global vision because our God is a global God. We must care about people. And to care about people means we should pray for people. And if you uh, would like, you can go on 
uh, websites like The Voice of the Martyrs. You can go to Open Door. You can go to joshuaproject.net, and they'll even send you a daily reminder of different people groups you can pray for, people groups that, that have not been exposed to the gospel. Uh, you can sign up for emails to, to hear about uh, what God is doing globally. And in many cases, they will also uh, let you know about the persecution that is going on around the world. But everywhere that you see great persecution, great opposition to the gospel, uh, the one thing that almost every person in those countries will tell you is to just pray that they stay faithful. Don't pray for their safety. They'll tell you, don't pray for our safety. Pray that, that we will stay faithful to the gospel. And we can learn a lot from that. So they're sent with a specific purpose, and then they've given a very clear message. As they go out, they are to proclaim the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And this is, this is the gospel, the kingdom of heaven. You will see in other uh, passages, it'll say the kingdom of God. They're interchangeable. But um, we need to understand that, that this is the same message you and I have a very clear, concise gospel message. Charles Spurgeon said that if there be anything about which we cannot tolerate lukewarmness, it is in the matter of sending the gospel to a dying world. Folks, there are people we do not have to look far. There are people all around us that do not have saving faith in Jesus Christ. They can check boxes, they can look the part, but their heart has not been changed. There is little evidence of salvation or no evidence of salvation. Where do we hear this earlier? Well, Matthew 3, John the Baptist, as John the Baptist is the forerunner for Christ. He is kind of that, that connection from the Old to the New Testament. He is uh, ushering in this time. He says, in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He was proclaiming the fact that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, that all those Old Testament prophecies, all those that were pointing to the Messiah, He is here. King Jesus has come. Israel was to be a, a channel for God's Spirit to work through, not a cul-de-sac but a conduit. If you live on a cul-de-sac, you know that there's no through traffic on a cul-de-sac. But we are to allow the Spirit of God to speak in us and through us. We are not just to be receivers of the grace, but we are to extend the grace of God. We are to extend this gospel message. Paul tells us in Romans 10, How then will they call on Him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in Him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And this is not just for preachers. This is for all believers. And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. Paul here is quoting from Isaiah. Romans 9, 10, and 11 are written uh, for the salvation of the Jewish people. But for all people, all people need to hear the gospel. John Piper says, There is no gospel apart from words. Nobody can be saved by watching deeds. So we must speak. We must be willing to give an answer for the hope we have within us. These 12 men, as they go out, they are given great authority. As they go, it says they are to heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse lepers, cast out demons. But he says, too, that they received without paying, so give without pay. In other words, they are, to, they are to trust that God has got them covered. That God is even going to provide for their most basic needs, even areas like food. It says, no bag for your journey or two tunics or sandals or staff for the Lord deserves, for the laborer deserves his food. He's saying that when you go out, trust that God is going to provide. He will raise up people to take care of of them, but they are going under the authority of Christ Himself. Some of you in your translations, you may have the word power, that they are to have power over unclean spirits. And, and there's nothing wrong with the word power, but, but this idea of authority, it is not their own authority. It is they have the authority of God Himself. There is no higher level of authority. 
We all answer to an audience of one. Jesus, at the beginning of the Great Commission, says, And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven on earth has been given to me. He had all authority. He had the proper authority. But as they went, they were to see the people. They needed to see that those around them were in desperate need of Christ. And one, we cannot see that if we do not go. This Christian life was not meant to be lived in isolation. We don't live in a bubble. We live in a real world, in real time. And we must be willing and ready at all time to share the gospel. Uh, Many of you will remember back a a decade ago, it was right after uh, Dr. Falwell had passed away and Larry King was doing a lot of interviews and Larry King had Larry Flint come in. And I won't go into all that, but many of you know who Larry Flint is. Uh, was and in that day I mean there's probably no more vile person in this country if you really you know understand the history there but he was interviewing Larry Flint about Jerry Falwell and interestingly Larry Flint had made this statement he goes you know no matter how many times and Jerry Falwell had sued Larry Flint so you know a defamation lawsuit and there's all these things that have gone on but he said, you know, there was a never a time, never a single time in all of our, you know, debates and arguing with each other and all that, that he never asked me, that he never did not ask me about my family. He said, I, and, you know, he, him and Dr. Falwell didn't exactly uh, see eye to eye on most anything, but he said he genuinely cared for me, that even in their debates, he cared for him greatly. Well, we can't do that if we aren't amongst people. And sometimes that's with people we are not going to agree with. Amen? We have got to be willing, though, to to take some punches if it means to share the gospel. Robert Moffat, who was the father-in-law to David Livingston. David Livingston was the great missionary, uh, English missionary that traveled throughout all of Africa. Uh, He charted the vast majority of Africa. Many of the maps that are still in use today of Africa were charted by David Livingston over 200 plus years ago. But Robert Moffat, his father-in-law, said this, Oh, that I had a thousand lives and a thousand bodies. All of them should be devoted to no other employment but to preach Christ to those degraded, despised, yet beloved mortals. How do we see people? Do we understand, though, in whose authority we rest and whose authority we sit under? It is Christ's authority. And just as he sent these 12, he sends us. You live today where you live because God puts you there. You might think all these things just arranged and all the crystals aligned and all my horoscopes kept. No, that stuff's all a lie, right? God has preordained to you be right where you are today. In the place you live, at the employment you have, uh, even in every context you are, God has you there to be sent. He has you there to be a witness, to share this hope. We serve him. We are under his authority and by his power. Jesus, his own words in John 15 says, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes it that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I've spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. This passage, he is speaking to his followers. He is speaking to you and I, those who claim the name of Christian, those who are disciples. We should bear fruit. How and why? Because God's very spirit is within us. He gives us his authority. Now, we aren't out there healing diseases and and healing afflictions and and casting out demons and and what these men were doing. Were, were doing. They were both apostles and disciples. They had been with Jesus. But we are to be sent people sharing the gospel, willing to do uh, or, or experience uh, some backlash, 
I mean, even in the country we live in today, the reality is we, we probably aren't going to experience uh, but so much persecution. Now, I'm not saying there's not to some level, but not to the extent of so many of our brothers and sisters worldwide who, as they share the gospel, are in uh, great danger of their very lives. Uh, I want to read this letter that Adoram Judson wrote to his father-in-law. He wrote this letter to Mr. Hazelton, asking him for his daughter's hand in marriage. He says, I have now to ask whether you can consent to part with your daughter early next spring to see her no more in this world. Whether you can consent to her departure to a heathen land and her subjection to the hardships and sufferings of a missionary life. Whether you can consent to her exposure to the dangers of the ocean, to the fatal influence of the southern climate of India, to every kind of want and distress, to degradation, insult, persecution, and perhaps a violent death. Can you consent to all this for the sake of him who left his heavenly home and died for her and for you, for the sake of perishing immortal souls, for the sake of Zion and the glory of God? Can you consent to all this in hope of soon meeting your daughter in the world of glory with a crown of righteousness brightened by the acclamations of praise which shall resound to her Savior from heathens saved through her means from eternal woe and despair? Now, I don't think we'll probably have anyone here who will ever write that letter or anywhere close to it. But do we understand that there is a cost? It will cost you. If nothing else, it will cost you time. And it may cost you some of your status. You see, we're not called to live the American dream, not as believers in Christ. We're not called to live a comfortable life. We're not called to, to make things easier for the next generation. No, we are called to serve Christ. And if through that serving that that is what occurs, then so be it. To God be the glory for it. But if not to God be the glory for it, if God did call you and I or our family members to a place that was surely death, what would we do? But are we even committed to sharing the truth of the gospel to a friend who may not want to hang out with you for a while because they don't want to hear it, or a family member. But will we be willing to trust that we are under the authority of Christ and we do not have a say? We are commanded to share this truth and we will be accountable. The last thing we see is that we have to trust the Lord for the results. Jesus says, as you enter a house, greet it. If the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. If it is not, let your peace return to you. If anyone will not receive you or listen to your words, listen to this. Shake off the dust from your, from your feet when you leave that house or town. You know, it's like water off a duck's bill. Hey, if you're faithful, we're not called to produce results. Uh, there's not a scorecard in heaven that says, hey, uh, some people act like that. Well, you know. You know, I've led 47,000 people to the Lord. Well, no, you didn't. You lied. And um, I mean, God could, right? God could. He certainly could. But are you willing to be that one person along that, you know, that journey that shared the gospel? That maybe it was long after you leave this earth that that person comes to faith and it was because of your faithful witness. Paul tells, Paul tells Titus, in chapter 3, he says, But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, He saved us. God saved us. We didn't save ourselves. Not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to His own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior. How will we respond? I had stumbled on this little um, this little story this week so I'm going to close with this this morning it says 3 a.m. cold winter cold morning in the winter 
A missionary candidate walked into an office for an appointment with the examiner of a mission board. The examiner had told him to report at 3 a.m. in the morning. The examiner would arrive at 8 a.m. five hours later. The examiner, without saying a word of explanation, sat down and said, let's begin. So you want to be a missionary with this mission agency? Yes. So I'm going to ask you a series of questions. First, can you please spell Baker? Anybody here spell Baker? Mary, maybe. Uh, B-A-K-E-R, the young man said. Very good. Now let me see how much you know about figures. Denny, how much is twice two? Four, he said. Excellent. I'm going to recommend to the board tomorrow that you be appointed as a missionary. You have passed the test, and he left. At the board meeting, the examiner spoke so highly of the applicant. He was one of the finest young men that I've ever met. He has all the qualifications of a missionary. First, he said, I tested him on self-denial. I told him I'd be at my house at 3 o'clock in the morning in the cold. This young man left a warm bed, came out in the cold, and never had a word of complaint. I mean, this is, this is fictitious, right? Because that doesn't happen in the church, right? I mean, churches never got anybody complaining about anything, right? I mean, the furthest place from that, so you can understand this, right? Secondly, I tested him on punctuality, and he was there on time. Thirdly, I examined him on patience. I made him wait five hours to see me. <laughs> we would not, we would, we, would, we would have left ten minutes in, right? He didn't even question why I was late. Fourth, I tested him on temper, and he didn't show any sign of it. Fifth, I tested his humility by asking him questions that a little child could answer, and he showed no offense. He meets the requirements. That's you and I. We don't have to have uh, distinguished titles. We do not have to have degrees. We do not have to have all of the things that uh, the world says we need. No, we simply need to be available. We simply need to allow God, working through His Son, by His Spirit, to use you and I to be His instruments, to be allowed to be a, a conduit, that God's Spirit can speak in and speak through as we go about our daily lives. That's what this word literally means when he tells them to go, to, to go into these communities. It is the same word that we see in the Great Commission that is, is literally translated as you are going. As you simply go about our daily lives, as we go and interact with those in our neighborhoods, I was outside one afternoon this week, and there's a, a, an older lady that lives at the end of our street, and um, and, and you know, and I, I have conversations with her, and she told me her brother had just passed away this uh, in the past week and a half, and and this lady is not a believer. Uh, matter of fact, she's uh, she would profess uh, to be an atheist, and I could just hear, just you know, I mean, you know, because there's no hope. And, you know, her brother passed away, and I said, you know, did, did her brother have any family? And she was like, no, he had, he had never had kids, and, and this lady has, has never had kids. And just, you can just see the blankness. So, I mean, and I'm asking, I'm telling you this, I'm not telling you because, you know, I, I'm not that smart, okay? I just trust God will just do something with my life, right? I just want to be obedient. That's all I want to be. You know, so we're going to take some stuff over there, uh, you know, tonight, tomorrow. Just, just, we just keep witnessing. Every Christmas, we, like, bombard our cul-de-sac with, with cookies. Like, everybody gets them. It don't matter whether you've cursed us out and, and yelled at our dogs, which does happen, and things of that nature. We're just going to love on everyone in our cul-de-sac. But I can tell you, every single, all 12 houses in our cul-de-sac, I can tell you the spiritual condition of every single person. I can't do that from my front porch. I can't do that inside my house. I have to engage those in the community. And so that's what, that's what we do. And I've done that at every place we've ever lived. I can go back over the last four houses, and I can still, right now, I can grid you that street, and I can tell you every person. They may not live there now, but I can tell you who they were, and I will tell you their spiritual condition. I can tell you if they were a believer in Christ, if they came to faith, or if they were not. That's got to be intentional. You have to make an effort. It doesn't just happen. I mean, yes, a neighbor may show up at your door or something like that. Uh, and that's probably not a coincidence either, right? But you have to be willing to respond. 
We have to trust that, that God is going to produce the results if you and I are just simply obedient. That's all he's asking us to do is to be obedient, understand we are all called and we all have his power. We are under his authority. If they mock you, that's good because they mocked their Savior. If they reject you, it's, it's not good, but I mean, then, then you are simply understanding what it is that Christ experienced. But you never know that that one person, and you may not see this, this side of glory. You may not. But one day, standing before our Lord and Savior, maybe he will say, you see that lady over there? Do you see that young boy over there? Do you see that person? Because you were faithful. I was able to work, and he didn't need us, right? He's going to save that person with or without us if that's his choice. But because we're obedient, we can see God's work in mighty ways. So I want to encourage you to, to, to be faithful. And, and as part of that, too, I want, to, I want to put this up on the screen. Um, some of you had saw this in the... Uh, uh, we did a ministry fair. And this is going to close with this. A ministry fair a few weeks ago. And um, so it's now virtual, so it's online. And so I want to make sure you look at this because this is really good. It's, it's, um, um, it's, it's got all the different areas of ministry in our church. And I want you to take your cell phone and I want you to take it out because in your bulletin is a QR code. And there also will be one at the end of this. And so all these slides are going to be going through and they're going to be sharing about all the different areas of ministry that you can be a part of. Now, listen, you may look at some of these and think, well, I don't understand what's spiritual about that. Well, that's because you aren't understanding that everything is spiritual. And that, uh, for instance, we have a small jobs ministry here. And I can tell you personally that that small jobs ministry is not just to physically meet a need, but it is to also, and it is to also hopefully meet a spiritual need, if that is in, in the case there. Uh, whether it is, is serving uh, in an area that is maybe behind the scenes in some way, but we all have uh, ability to serve. We need to serve somewhere, allowing God to use those gifts and talents we have. And maybe those are just simply, you have the gift of encouragement. I know 80% of us have the gift of discouragement, but there's that handful that have the gift of encouragement. Amen? Amen. You can spot the discouragement easily, right? But you just, you're, you're just a good encouragement, right? You know, you go and, and partner with Miss Debbie and, and, and those who love writing these letters to encourage people. I mean, if you've gotten a card, you know, someone took that time. And people still like those, believe it or not. But just find where it is you can serve. So, I mean, don't leave here. You don't really need to pray that much about this because you should have already been praying where God would have you to serve. That's a cop-out most of the time because you're not really praying. Most people aren't. I'm not saying there's three of you that are super spiritual that are, but you should have already been praying. And as you see, you should be like, yep, I just need to step up. We are called to go. Cause it's like, it's like, what did Jesus do? You kind of love this, right? Jesus literally sits there and says, uh, so the harvest is plentiful, but the labor's a few. So why don't y'all start praying? Oh, by the way, y'all are headed out. You are the ones that are going to answer this prayer. You were praying, but all along, I was planning on sending you anyway. But he wants us to be dependent upon him. So, so I just want to encourage you to find your place. And there's other things that aren't even up there, um, areas with uh, kids and, and, and helping uh, with uh, any number of things. So see where it is that God would have you to be, but do something. To do nothing is not an answer. Amen? So, But we can't do any of this if we're not walking with Christ. So I um, encourage you this morning, if you have never by faith alone trusted in Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, that's got to be the first step. And it has to be genuine conversion, which is that you are born again, that God gives you a new heart, a heart that will desire the things of God. Because apart from Christ, we will not have a desire for the things of God. It doesn't mean you're, you're, you know, you're, you're the most... Well, we, we, it does mean we're all horrible people, actually, <laughs> apart from Christ. But, but he gives us a heart to desire the things of God. And so you know you're a Christian when there is that evidence in you that you have been a changed life because you cannot meet Christ and continue to live the same way. You can't. 
It affects every single part of you. It affects who you are, how you live. It affects the way you live. It affects all of us. So figure out what is that next step, whether that is salvation, or maybe it's you need to step forward in, in obedience to uh, the Great Commission and be baptized. Or maybe you need to step forward and serve in some capacity. Uh, get involved in, in a small group. That's how you're going to be ministered to. Okay, as, as just God blesses and our congregation grows, we just we need more people. So that's where those small groups come into play. Get involved so they are caring for you. I hope I'm the, like the 12th person that hears about something going on with you. I don't need to be the first person, right? There's over 250 of you. I can't keep up with the five in my house half the time. So I, I can't, okay? And guess what, folks? I'm not called to. I am called to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. That means you and I together. I don't have pixie dust in my pocket. I really don't. If you call me because you want me to pray, there is 50 other people you should be doing the same thing for. I'm not saying I won't. I'm just saying we're in this together. Let's understand God's doing a great thing, and let's be faithful to him. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for that, God, your word has promised that it will not return void. May we be found faithful uh, to serving, faithful to sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. The Father, that in that day and on that time that we will stand and be accounted for what we did with what you gave us. Father, may we just hear those words, well done, that we were faithful with all you gave us. May we not look for the success of the world, but may we simply look for faithfulness in serving our King, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.